Hell yeah! Well, you don't normally see me talking in English here on my channel. Normally do, you know, Portuguese reviews on films and, and culture and, and art. I was listening to a video of Rick Beato. I, I think you know it. I mean, if, you, if you're into music, especially, you know, guitars music. Then I listened to something interesting there and I thought about my friend Osa. That is really cool to talk about this stuff. She has a vast background on music, of course. She's a brilliant artist, performer, singer and also a very generous and caring friend. <laughs> and I have numerous musicians friends and I must say that the most powerful voice, the most powerful ever actually, I've ever seen live, it's hers. Friends or not, you know, other bands and solo artists, and I've seen quite a lot of stuff, but she's just astonishing. Bruno, What's up? Bruno, I, we need, I need to have you around more because that's <laughs> a great intro. I want to keep on with that one. Thank you. Well, it's just, it's just true, you know? It's, it's transcendent, you know, to, to listen to you singing. Very flattering, very kind, because I love it. Um, I feel that when I sing is transcendent. So if that translates, then that's great. So how how's life? Just to you know catch up. It, I, it, look, it's pretty cool. Good considering. Um, I think our prime minister here in in Britain said uh, we're all in the same storm. We're all in it together. And my other half was like, that's bullshit. We're in the same storm, but we all have different v vessels. You know, some people are in a luxury luxury yacht. Some people have barely have like a piece of wood that they're holding onto, and. So given all of that, we're okay. And we see there's nothing to do, very little to do live. All gigs disappeared, very yeah. little work. But I'm working on a really exciting project with uh, music, well, genius really, Imogen Heap. She was actually going on tour to Brazil, but um, she was doing a world tour, spreading the word about music identity and data. Wow. And uh, we did, did manage to get Latin, Latin America or Brazil under that belt. So that, that could be for a, a different part. But that's obviously, you know, this is data, identity, internet and music related. So I've been doing that a lot this year and we're about to launch. So all, all things considering, we're okay. But is it a database or is it a streaming platform? Not streaming platform. I can tell you what it's not. It's not a streaming platform. It's not a music publishing platform. It's not a music collective platform. It's not distribution. It's data. Like the shortest version to describe it, it's kind of like an IMBD stroke LinkedIn oh. for, for music, but added uh, the attachment of verified identity. Data online is only valuable if you can link it to an identity, which is what is being the misused so much, but yeah. there's a positive side to it as well. So it's an admin tool and connective tool. And we just need one place for all music makers to go and dump their information about themselves. So, you know, if you want to find something online now, it's Google and that's, it's yeah. huge. This is an actual problem solving solution coming from a music maker place. Unlike many artists, she writes, produces, engineers, and mixes all her own stuff. So she is, you know, she's a, like a little unicorn in, in, in that sense. Yeah. And she went from being signed all her life to take it to wanting to go independent. And that's where she stumbled upon or, you know, stumbles upon all these things. And she, because she's quite technical, she's like, this, this should be so much easier. This really should be so much easier. It's really, really complicated. We need a platform. And, and that's kind of where, and you can, you can feel that when you get to know the platform because it's coming from a music maker solution driven place, mm -hmm. which will make the entire industry a lot more efficient rather than going, hmm, things are changing. Let me see if I can create a quick buck based yeah. on music. And I like streaming, for example. The issues with streaming is it hasn't really solved the listening experience. No. The listening experience has always been visual. What am I listening to? Who made it? What do they look like? There's a lot of, a lot of stuff um, to, to sort out still. Obviously, we're not touching on the streaming part, but a common link denominator through the whole thing is data. It's more complex than, than it seems, I'm sure. Yes. Next time we can record and talk about yeah. that. All right, so a bunch of stuff to talk, you know, discuss on, on future videos. The other topic that I wanted to talk about, and you, and you already, you know, pointed out with Kate Perry and Dagny stuff, is I never heard of those songs you know, from Dagny with uh, okay. Love You Like That and Katy Perry's Never Really Over. And then mm -hmm. I listened to it on this video that I mentioned about Ricky and, mm -hmm. and he was just, you know, he had the same thing when I, when I listened to both of them that is like, oh, it's the same song. 
why it's mm. not an issue? What, what's, what's going on here? What, what is not, you know, plagiarism or whatever? And then we, we talked on, on the, on, on, we, we chat, right? And then yeah. you talked about uh, Pharrell Williams with Marvin Gaye. And there was a the yeah. thing there. And then the, the, the Townsend family, right? Marvin Gaye family yeah. get the rights for that. It, it's a yeah. really complicated thing. And you yeah. pointed right to the core of it. That is, when you listen to a lot of stuff, how do you point out where the influence came from, right? So this was uh, my, the, my Pharrell Williams and the Marvin Gaye example came up before I'd listened to this, um, the Dagny, uh, Katy Perry, which I think are two very, very different things. Yeah, I didn't know that then, but then I, I started to research like, oh, okay, so yeah. this happened here and everything else is something else, but go on. Yeah. The Marvin Gaye and the Pharrell, that is, it's, it's uncannily similar and clearly they were not given a backing track. There was no, you know, and there were also, there were also no credits. But the, the interesting thing, or the right thing with the Katy Perry Dagny is that they're actually all on each other's tracks. They're giving each other credit for it which is rightly so. And I think that, you know, we might never know, but I do think that originally there was a backing track that was floating around and then things were written on top of it. And this happens, this happens a lot. And this happens a lot anywhere that you have a few songwriters in a room and it's clearly an idea that came with these songwriters. And then along the way, before it becomes a hit, suddenly one person is taken out of it and they don't get credit for it. And at the same time, me love some samples, you know, hip hop did this a lot, you know, and electronic. So it's very blurry, you know, this. Yeah. But samples have their own laws around them. And samples, you know, because hip hop brought samples to the very forefront. And to me, it's evident that a lot of the hip hop tracks, the f and I remember the first time I ever came across a sample in, in that sort of sense was Fuji's. Enya. And I didn't know it was Enya. That track would be something completely else without Enya. So of course they have to pay Enya for the sample. But so, and samples have a much bigger law around them than re-recordings. So I could take a Dagny track and I could re-record it. And even if I do it exactly like theirs, it's my recording. And I don't necessarily have to give them as much as if I sampled it. Taylor Swift. I don't know if you know much about Taylor Swift, who I highly respect as a as a as a pop and a songwriter. She I know a, there's an issue there as well with you know yeah, plagiarism. A very tumultuous relationship with her manager, and as far as I can gather, he's basically being a D.I.C.K. and he's holding her rights. And there's been, you know, she's tried to negotiate herself free and her catalogue has been sold again. And she thought, great, I can collaborate with these new people that have bought the catalogue. But it turns out that Scooter Brown has not let go of her and he still has whatever she does with the tracks. He still has the final say. So she's decided, screw this. I'm just going to re-record every song I wrote from scratch and improve it, that's going to be my catalogue. And I, I love that. You form a band and your, your dream is to be, you know, spotted by an A&R and then you get a contract with a, a big company. And the next 10 years, your dream is to get rid of the company, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is unfortunately often the way. Not always, but often. Nick Cave and the Bad Seas, I believe he's been, he was with Mute for ages, for a really, really long time. But it is, that's a good point, Bruno, actually, because why, why does it need to be like that? No, but I mean, <laughs> if, you, if you have more freedom doing your, your own, you know, distribution and publishing and taking care of your rights and all, great, do it. But sometimes you need, you know, like you said, the, the, the machine, the system, the industry to push I mean, if you get to that level, right? And I'm talking, you know, Madonna, Britney Spears, Sia, uh, Diplo with Major Lazer, all these R&B cats and all. If you are indie and you want to stay indie forever, maybe you, you don't sign, right? But, but also don't complain you didn't sign. Don't complain you, you're not big enough. Don't complain this and that, right? It's, it's tricky. It's, I think it's I very think personal. <laughs> It is, it is tricky also because if you don't sign, you can't compete. 
because there is so much noise out there and these the, the 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 bigger budgets have the not the always the best music but they have the ability to drown out the noise and so that's one thing that that interested me in this topic you know because well, what i read on interviews from dagny i, I haven't seen anything when on my search from Katy Perry team, but I've seen mm. Dagny, you know, coming out with, yeah, I'm very flattered that they found interest, interest in my music and mm -hmm. that they did that, that move to come to me and say, oh, I got really, you know, inspired by your song. So that's why mm. I don't think it's a, you know, a backing track that was going around because she said, I, I was inspired, you know, Katy Perry's statement is that I, I was inspired by your song Dagny. So she listened to the whole thing, you know, it's not like she listened to the backtrack and, and built on that, right? And mm -hmm. uh and uh and then Dagny said, yeah, I'm I'm glad I'm part of it. She was credited as one of the songwriters for the Katy Perry song. I was just thinking this, like what if she didn't sign? Because I, I bet but that's me, I don't know, I don't have the same, you know, insider, you know, thing that you do. But I, I, I think that Katy Perry's gang, right? Katy Perry crew camp or whatever came and said, okay, so here's the, your contract. Sign it if you want. If you don't, then we'll, we'll meet at court, you know? And, and then they paid her off. So that's what got me interested on that topic. It's mm. like, you know, David versus Goliath thing. It's very interesting to see how it goes. I mean, it's not a, a new song, right? Uh, Dagny did hers on 2017, I think. And Katy Perry, it, I, I'm not sure if it's now, it's 2020 or 2019. I just listened to it now. To see how it, how it still grow, right? Because if you go to, to back to, to Katy Perry's catalog, it's pff, huge, like the, the, the the volume of hits, right? People listen to it. And it's not the same yeah. with Dagny. And I'm interested in see like next year to go back to her track and see if that's her most successful track ever because of Kate Perry's or not, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, so there, because there are lots of things here. Um, one of the one of the things in the machinery to make a, a tune big is the story. I mean, the story of another artist being inspired by another is so much prettier than, hey, there was a backing track that was looped around and I ha and I really liked it. I let it lie for two years. And in the, in the meantime, this Norwegian artist did a track on it. And when I revisited it, it was already taken, but, I, but I'd already written a song on it. That, that's such a gray, boring. Really? Is that how pop music comes about? That's so crap, right? It's much nicer to, 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 to share a story of, of of inspiration. The Norwegian pop scene, as well as the Swedish pop scene, has very strong links with the American. So for me, it is really not that unthinkable that it would be an attract share. It's also not totally unthinkable that she would come up on her radar in that sense. You know, there are some monolithic pop writers in, in Norway that have come Sweden, of course, but, but that, that, that have come up in recent years. And Norwegians also know that if you want a big hit, you send them to, to Sweden. So it's all that networking stuff that, that, that goes along. And I guess in that sense, we'll never know. But I do know that a story of one being inspired by another is a lot nicer than it was a backing track and we just happened to grow the same song around it. Yeah, because so then that. she listened to her, right? Yeah. Like well, I listen to your music, that. it's great. And I yeah. wish I'd, I have done something like that. So yeah. I'm doing it yeah, and I want to yeah. give credit to you. And when, yeah. the, when she says, I want to give credit to you, is this like, I'll, I'll pay you, right? <laughs> yeah well she if not paid she she's part of the publishing which which I, which I hope she didn't get a buyout I hope she would have been part part of it if it was a backing track then she wouldn't have a choice other than to do that because it's impossible to pick those you know Dagny's already written on it if that if that was the way that it came about Dagny has 33 million listens on that track and she or and I had been listening to this track for a while because I uh, because I like it it's good it's a good pop pop electro. I don't know how famous this story with her and, and uh, I'd never heard of it and I'm Norwegian and I like Dagny so I'd actually never heard. Me neither this. but then I start to, to look for it and you know there were some well it's actually American magazines like Rolling Stones and, and but the outlets in Brazil were covering that maybe just you know translating it from the English I don't know 
but it's on billboard it's on you know variety i think I, i've seen yeah. something so it, it gets to the you know mainstream it, on, it on the internet yeah it got some it got some attention yeah i would love to know ultimately that, that it boils down to was it a backing track that was flying around or did somebody in your camp put together a mood board you happen to cr cross upon their song Another thing that also can happen, this has happened to me, you write a track, producers get involved, and you start coming up with stuff, and somebody goes, oh my God, this sounds really, really similar to... Yeah, then, it can happen. Know, and, and, and it's yeah. very difficult to say, it's like, it, and that, that can happen, it's like, I never heard that track, nobody in this room has ever heard it, but it's too similar, <laughs> kind of what can we do? And I personally prefer the Dagny one. I, I, I really dig... Dagny's version, but I believe I like Kate Perry's more, and and I'm guilty of it. I, I I feel like no, Bruno, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> an interesting thing as well, because and then I start to listen more to it, you know, and then I realized there's more songs that look like it, you know, and and in get into that blurry plagiarism thing. First, I, I have a playlist on Spotify only with songs that look or sound similar to other songs. And I start doing that with metal and then I expand it. But with these both tracks, you know, Never Really Over and Love You Like That, um, they both in A, right? And then there's Meredith Brooks, Bitch. Remember that, that song? I'm a bitch. I'm yeah, but remember how it starts? Like, you know, and it's also an A, A major, right? It's there, like the interval is the same, the tempo, like fucking hell. It's why, why are they not talking about this, you know, and they're talking about Kate Perry and Dagny, but there's also Meredith Brooks. And then on Dagny's version, on, on her chorus, there's, there's a, a timing and a deliver. And also the lyrics, it's, there's, a, there's a hint there with... And that's completely, you know, off, but Eminem Slim Shady. <laughs> Which one? He goes, I'm Slim Shady as I'm the real Shady, or you are Slim Shady, I just am a tiny, you know? But then... Yeah. <laughs> and she goes, she, 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 she uses Rio as well, I think, or, or I'm, I'm something. I don't remember the lyrics for Dagny. Do you remember the chorus? <laughs> All right. <laughs> when she goes to I love you like that, it's already, you know, something else. But the, the, the first bits, you know, tan, ta -dan, tan, -dan, tan, -dan, tan, tan, is the same yeah. deliver as, as yeah. Slim Shady. <laughs> yeah, the, this is also how hip hop influenced pop, I think. But, I, but you know, the, the, the two chord song, you know my stuff, do it again. That is literally two chords and the chorus is, is pretty much like this and it is a pop writing technique. I didn't use it technique, it just came out like that. Because when it is very few chords, you do end up finding a rhythm. I, I bet you, if we put our heads to it, we could find more songs oh, that yeah. could fit in for that two chord thing that still has a, a rhythmical one note thing, mm -hmm. which is highly effective, it's really it's sure. spooky. That was the thing, I mean, I was interested in all that because uh, I listen to music all, all day long. <laughs> Yeah. And I just like, my brain, brain just go, woo, you know, mm. that's so cool that you, that you, that you link those stuff. So when, when somebody else, you know, do the link for me, it's also mm -hmm. interesting, you know, and yeah. that's what he did because he was listening to it and I wasn't. <laughs> I think we will get more and more of that. We already have more of that just because that, because the industry is, uh, is run by as it was also in the 70s, but it's just that people didn't write in the same way. You know, this, the pop tracks in particular. Do you, you know Max Martin, the Swedish guy producer, Max Martin? You know, he's written for everyone. He started with Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Pink, The Weeknd, Bon Jovi. I mean, you, there's nobody that this man hasn't written for, and he's a pop genius. The kings and queens of that sort of genre is not, we're not talking about 2,000 different writers. It's, it's, a, it's a small pool. It's like Timbaland did, you know, in the early 2000s, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he worked with everybody, mm -hmm. you know. We have the same yeah. if, with producers uh, for, you know, metal genres. <laughs> like these guys that, you know, have, in, have been working with everybody and... And, and uh, they just really get that genre and so they get all the work and then it just yeah. sounds a bit, it, it, it can sound a bit same. Yeah, way. and become a yeah. reference, right? I want this to sound like Scott Burns. It's really cool. All right. I like it. Anytime. <laughs>
when, when something else come up with you know the pop scene and any anything music related actually i'll come to you sweet i miss you okay bye bye this gives such a full sense of closeness oh right? yeah this, this is crap i mean i'm going to contact people more and blah blah and then you 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 chat and it's great and then you hang up and you're depressed you know <laughs>